I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> well, little Miss Sally, you look as though you've been outdoors today. Yes, I have. And I've had a very exciting time. I've been out in the woods and I saw the most interesting thing. What did you see? Well, we were looking at bird's nests. And you know, you can see them so much easier now because the leaves are off the trees. And you know what we saw? No, what did you see? We saw a field mouse come out of the bird's nest. Well, what do you know about that? When the birds go away, the field mice move in. Yes, yes. It certainly is, and I'm glad you told me about it. I, I thought you would like it. And now, would you please tell me what's interesting in the funnies today? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will. I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the first section, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Dick's guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy has learned that Meeker is the man who's been selling guns to the Indians, which is against the law. Hoppy has followed Meeker onto a steamboat, just as Meeker orders it down the river to make his escape. But Meeker tricked Hoppy, knocked him unconscious, and locked him in the cargo hold in the bottom of the boat. And then Meeker ordered the captain to proceed down the river into the rapids and rocks where the boat crashed. Meeker gets away in a rowboat, sure that the rapids will destroy all trace of the boat and of Hoppy. Last picture top row, Hoppy, who has come to, realizes that the boat is sinking and that he's locked in the hold. He sees the machine weighing several tons tied to the center of the hole. First picture next row, Hoppy says, well, if this cargo is as heavy as it looks, I've got one chance. As the boat tips to one side, the ropes on the lower side become slack. Quickly, Hoppy starts to untie the ropes, saying, I've got to untie this last one before we roll to the other side. He makes it just in time. Slowly, the boat begins to tip to the other side. The heavy machinery slides down the floor and crashes through the side of the boat, first to the bottom roll. The pressure of the water forces the boat back to its other side. As it comes up, Hoppy leaps out of the hole the machinery made in the wall, landing in the rushing water. Last picture. The marshal, California and Lucky who have gone down the river on horse trying to catch up with the steamers, stop as they hear something on the river. Marshall says, Hey, sounds like a rowboat heading this way. California exclaims, Yeah, but is it Hoppy or is it Meeker? Oh, I'm glad that Hoppy escaped from the, the steamer, but how can he ever swim through those roaring rough waters? Especially with boots on. It'll take a strong man to swim safely through that. I hope he makes it. I know that must be Meeker in that boat. I hope California catches him when he comes to shore. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now? Oh, now let's turn over the page and see if Prince Valiant is there again. Very well. Over the page we go. All right. See? I'm right. There he is on page three. And you remember last week Val's father and the Danes were having a battle at sea. Yes, and the Danes have set one of Val's ships afire. And now Val's ships have been separated from each other and the Danes can attack from both sides. Oh, now is the time when they need Boltar, who's a great fighter. I wish he'd stop sulking and come back. Well, let's see whether Boltar will forget his quarrel with the king and come back and help. After all, he must know that Tillicum, the woman he loves, is on one of those ships and that she'll be captured if the Danes win. So quick, read, please. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Grey Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> the deck of his great dragon ship, 
King Aguarapul sees his line of ships broken, and the Danes surge through. He calls on his reserves to stop the gap, but the damage has been done. Straight for the rear of the right wing glide the fierce Danes. Here in other battles is rage Boltar, a tower of strength. And now, Alita and Prince Arn, a woman and a babe, are in command. Last picture, top row, the king sees what's happening, and he mutters, Oh, fool that I was to listen to a woman's advice. May good fortune be with them. For if we break our line to go to their aid, it will spell defeat. At that moment, on a ship far out at sea, Boltar, Boltar, sees the great sea battle. First picture, next row. He sees the Danes, a Val ships outnumbered. And even though he has quarreled with the king and has been outlawed and is no longer the king's man, he still is not going to let the king enjoy all the good fighting. His booming voice urges his mariners on. Closer and closer move Voltar's ships toward the right wing, which was his place. And king or no king, he means to be there. For Voltar knows that somewhere in that awful battle is Tilikum. Hotter and hotter grows the battle. Val's singing sword flashes more and more swiftly. The king fights more and more furiously. For they are being pressed back by the Danes. Things begin to look bad for them. When suddenly, above the thunder of battle... The king hears the roar of Boltar's battle cry. The king returns first picture bottom row to the fight with renewed hope. More and more furious goes the battle. And then on the left wing, the Danes have won a foothold. And step by step, ship by ship, Prince Valiant and his warriors are being driven back. The great sea battle seems to be turning in favor of the Danes. When last picture, a great horn is heard. And the horn is sounding retreat. Well, well, who's blowing that horn? Val's men or the kings or, or is it the Danes? Well, I'm not sure. Well, I wish I knew because the loser is always the one who sounds retreat. Well, let's certainly hope that Boltar coming to their aid has frightened the Danes so that they're the ones who have had enough. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now I'm anxious to find out what happens next in Dick's adventure. Very well, then. Let's turn over to the very last page of the very first section. Last page of the first section. And here's Dick. And he's in the early days of America, and he's gone into the wilderness on an exploring expedition with Captain Lewis and Captain Clark. And they came into the wilderness, and there they were met by Indians who warned them not to go any further. And the Indians invited them to stay with them. So Captain Lewis and Clark decided to do that. And then the next morning, Dick and Captain Lewis went hunting, and they came to the Indian village, and it was all deserted. And in one of the lodges, they found a man all tied up. Yes, it was a French-Canadian who was a prisoner of the Indians. He told them not to trust the Indians. And then Dick and Captain Lewis untied that man, and he led them to the place where the Indians were having a war dance. And I'm anxious to know whether Dick and Captain Lewis got back to their ship before the Indians saw them. Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Dick's adventures. And say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Peering through the forest, Dick and Lewis see the Indians in the frenzy of a war dance. Dick says, Hey, let's get out of here quick, Captain. And they turn to make their way through the woods. They are seen by one of the Indian scouts. He gives a signal. Ayo! Ayo! And the chase of death begins. As they see the Indians closing in on them, Dick makes a torch and sets fire to the brush. Last picture, top roll. And Dick says, This bonfire might hold them up for a while. And on they run. The Indians set bonfires, too, forcing Dick, Lewis, and the French-Canadian to find a new way back. A short time later, Dick and Captain Lewis, who come by a roundabout way, emerge from the forest near the landing. 
and they see, last picture, second row, Indians attacking the men on their boat. A desperate struggle is taking place. Quickly, they slip under the boat, and first picture, bottom row, swing their cannon around on the Indians. And then... One shot from the cannon, which the Indians call Big Medicine, cures them of their treachery, and the Indians run for the woods. Last picture, the Lewis and Clark expedition is on its way again. The first skirmish with the Indians is won, but as they cross through the Dakotas, huge floats of ice grind away at their boats. And the men work hard with long poles, forcing their way through the ice. And always, lining the shores, are the Indians, waiting, armed, and silent. Ooh, that's terribly dangerous, isn't it? That ice can grind a hole in the boat and then they might sink. Yes, and on shore are the Indians waiting to take them. Well, I'm glad they got away from the Indians the first time. So am I, but it looks like Dick will be living with adventure for quite a while. Yes, I wonder what'll happen next week. Well, I know how to find out. <laughs> so do I, I'll be here. <laughs> All right. Now look underneath Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, and I've been worried about this because last week, remember those crooks, Sir Percival and that man named Nobby that's pretending to be his chauffeur? They've come to the Milestone Farm and... And Mr. Miles trusts them. Yes, and also the bank delivered some very expensive gold cups which were to be given in the horseshoe. And that Sir Percival plans to steal those gold cups and then to put the blame on Rusty and that boy Pete. And that makes me so mad I could just, I could just, well, I, I don't know just what I could do, but I could do it. Well, let's read right now and see what happens next with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> After showing the boys the gold cups, Mr. Miles tells them he must put them away. And then he takes Sir Percival to dinner to the country club. Last picture top row, they arrive at the club in Sir Percival's car with Nobby driving. As they get out, Sir Percival turns to Nobby saying, oh, We'll be here an hour or so, Nobbs. Uh, you may go get some dinner if you like. And Nobby replies, Oh, thanks, Sir Percival. But I ate before we came here. I'll just park the car and whiten it for you. First picture bottom row, they're having dinner in the club. Mr. Miles is saying to Sir Percival, uh, Do you think you can remain for our big charity horse show, Sir Percival? Sir Percival replies, Oh, unfortunately, no, no. Uh, nothing would give me more pleasure. But alas, uh, other business presses. As a matter of fact, uh, Nobbs and I have to leave tonight. <laughs> Meanwhile, outside the club, Nobbs, who has waited a while, parks his car, then says, Now, to get back to Marstoon Farm in a hurry, I don't dare take our car. I'll hail a taxi on the highway and stop about two blocks from the farm. A little later, in Rusty's room at the Miles Farm, he's awakened by Pete. Hey, Rusty, come on, wake up. I think somebody's prowling around the driveway. Rusty exclaims, w What's that? Oh, it's you, Pete. Hey, wait, 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 I'll switch on the light. Last picture, Pete says. Hey, no, no, Rusty, don't turn on the light. Come on to my room. We can see the driveway from there. Rusty replies. Oh, sure. You go and watch, Pete. I'll join you as soon as I get some clothes on. Oh, I'm glad that Pete and Rusty are awake because I'll bet you that what they hear is that crook Nobby just coming back to steal the gold cup. That's exactly what they hear, I'm sure. He's doing it while Mr. Miles is at dinner with Sir Percival, so Mr. Miles will not think that Sir Percival or Nobbs could be the crooks. And that's his scheme to try to blame Rusty for it. I wonder if it'll work. Well, we'll find that out next week. All right. Now it's time for Dagwood and Bundy, and here they are on the first page of the second section. And I'll read that in just a moment, but first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Rama foo, rama fum, zim, zim, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood's boss, Mr. Jitters, is having trouble with his wife again. She stopped in his office and is laying him out good. I don't want to cause a scene here at the office, but just wait till you get home tonight. Dithers nods his head in anguish. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. 
As soon as his wife leaves, Dithers begins to cry. Dagwood walks over and pats him on the shoulder. Dithers sobs. And you'll hear what I'm going to get when I get home tonight. Ah, Dagwood, nobody loves me. Oh, don't say that, Mr. Dithers. And Dagwood begins to cry. (laughs) And then, first picture next row, the office staff gathers around, and they begin to cry. The office boy sobs. We love you, Mr. Dithers. But Dithers pushes Dagwood away dramatically, saying, No, no, it's no use. This is the end. It's the river for me. Dagwood, on bended knees, grabs him by the foot, stopping him. Oh, don't go, please, please. You have a home. My home is your home, Mr. Dithers. Come live with us. Oh, you mean somebody cares whether I live or die? Yes, yes, we'll fix up the spare room for you at our house. You'll be one of the family. Mr. Dithers stops crying, drops to his knees, kisses Dagwood's hand and says, Ah, uh, I'm wanted. First picture next row, Dagwood and Dithers come up the walk to the Bumstead house. Dagwood tells him, We'll serve your meals to you in your own room, or you may eat at the table with us. Dithers replies, Oh, I want to eat with you, Dagwood. I want to feel as though I belong. They open the door and enter the house. And they find it topsy-turvy, pictures on the floor, chairs turned upside down, rugs rolled up, the lamps disconnected, and Blondie tells them, I'm house cleaning. You will have to climb over the furniture. As they climb over the furniture to get to the kitchen, she tells them, You will have to make your own supper. There's a can of beans and the can opener on the table. First picture, bottom row, Dagwood, dressed in a ruffled apron, takes the food off the stove. A terrible smell comes up. Dagwood moans. Oh, I burned the beans. Dithers buries his face in his arms and moans. Burn beans. Ugh. Suddenly, there's a... It's Dithers tearing out of the Bumstead house. Dagwood yells, Come back, Mr. Dithers. We love you. We want you. Last picture, the door of Dithers' house opens. In he walks, a smile on his face, and he says, Ah, uh, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. And waiting inside the door to the next room is his wife, a scowl on her face and a baseball bat in her hands. And you just know that this is going to happen. Oh, 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 no, oh, no. Goodness gracious me, what a house. Yes, a wife waiting for him with a bat in her hand. Oh, isn't that dithers funny? (laughs) He'd rather be hit on the head by his wife than eat Dagwood's food. Some people are very strange, aren't they? Yes. Well, now look under Dagwood and Blondie. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. And you remember, Roy was trying to capture the cattle rustlers, and they did a terrible thing. Yes, they caught Roy and locked him and Doleful Hawkins in a caboose. That's a car of a train, and they pushed it down the track. Yes, but Roy fooled them because he got out of the uh, the, the the car before he went off the track. Yes. And then a strange man came along up that trail and found Roy trying to get Doleful loose on some rocks that he got stuck between when he jumped. I wonder who that stranger is. Well, let's find out now. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip yo <laughs> Stranger gets off his horse, picks up a pole lying nearby, puts it under the rock, and pries it up. Hey, oh, no, 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 no. Roy drags Doleful out from under. The stranger says, Now you see how easy it is to extricate your friend, Rocky, Bill Dawson. Matter of leverage, as discovered by the Greek scientist Archimedes. Roy sees that the stranger thinks that they're the rustlers. He says nothing as the man, third picture, hands Roy a fistful of money, saying... As you probably know, I'm Judge Sinmika, your employer. You did a good job rustling that train load of cattle. But uh, what happened to the old caboose hideout? Roy replies, Well, well, it, it broke loose. We, we, we jumped off just in time. Last picture, top row, the stranger mounts his horse, saying, Well, go back up the mountain and find your mounts, boys. I'll see you at my ranch tomorrow. You will help rebrand the stolen cattle. <laughs> Sometime later, first picture bottom row, Roy and Doleful, making their way back along the tracks, come upon a campfire and two men. Doleful exclaims, hey, Roy, there's Dude and Rocky, the real rustlers. Roy sees Trigger and Doleful's horse a short distance away from where the men are standing, and he whispers, Yeah, after we grab our horses, we'll trail Meeker to his ranch. We 
Got to get the cattle back and break up this rustling gang. Roy starts to tiptoe toward Trigger. Trigger sees him and whinnies with joy. Rocky and Dude leap to their feet, grab for their guns. As Rocky goes for Doleful, Dude snaps at Roy. Get him up, cowboy, quick. Last picture, Roy and Doleful are in the rustler's hands again. Dude glares at Roy through slit eyes and says, Well, I have a hunch the boss, Judd Meeker, will be plumb glad to meet the two hombres who try to ruin our last home. And Rocky grins, Yeah, he sure will, dude. Trigger whinnied because that made the bandits look up. Yes, but Roy, or Trigger, was so glad to see Roy, he just couldn't help himself. But you can't blame a horse, especially when it's glad. No, I should say not. I wonder what'll happen next. Roy's had so much trouble. Well, maybe next week we'll see that Roy will outfox dude again. Oh, I hope so. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. All right. Over oh, look, there's Flash Gordon, and he's really in great danger. I should say so. First, he was captured by Menta, the cruel queen of the Martians, on a planet way up in the sky. And then, just as he's escaped from her and uh, captured her men, then a wild tornado came toward the city. Yes, a tornado blowing a desert of sand at them. A tornado so wild that Menta was sure it would bury them all alive. But Flash turned a machine at it and tried to stop it. I wonder whether he'll be able to. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon, Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Battling to keep a desert hurricane from smashing the capital city of Mars, Flash risks his life in a last desperate effort. He shoots a jet of burning hydroxium into the storm, setting fire to the hard driven sand itself. Last picture top row, for a frightful moment it seems that Flash's daring experiment is backfiring on him where the burning sands melt in a flood of liquid flame that threatens to engulf a handful of humans. But Flash is prepared. First picture bottom roll, he aims his zero-ray projector at the flames and freezes the onrushing flame into strange and fantastic shapes. They are surrounded by a man-made wall of frozen sand and flames which protects the Martian city from the hurricane of sand behind it. With an almost human frenzy, the flames beat against the barrier then finally subside in defeat. With the danger past, Flash gets a hero's reward from Dale, a kiss. And even the ruthless Queen Menta mutters her thanks to the Earthmen. But they are not to have peace for long. Menta receives another thought message that tells her the sandstorm has dammed the Great Canal and waters are beginning to flood the city. At last picture, they see a sky car coming to pick them up. Menta says to Flash that now they'll see if he can finish the job he started. Oh, wasn't Flash smart to stop that hurricane with those machines that Menda had? You bet he was. That was positively brilliant. Yes, but if the water is going to flood the city, well, how can he ever stop that? Because I've heard about floods and, and whole cities are covered with waters and it runs in the stores and everything. Well, that's something we'll find out about next week. Now, look across the page. Oh, there's my favorite, favorite, Br'er Rabbit. And I know you don't want me to waste a second, so here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a, it a habit, habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, If it has anything to do with honey, oh, Br'er Bar can be counted on. To be counted in. Yes, if anybody steals honey, you can be sure that suspicion might point to old Br'er Bar. Well, Br'er Rabbit is down at the community store, standing in front of a sign which reads, Wild Honey, Special, 17 cents. And Br'er Coon is telling Br'er Rabbit that his honey has been disappearing. Yes, yeah, somebody's been snatching these honey jars from right out of my nose. Br'er Rabbit replies, And I've got a rambling suspicion about who is doing it. Br'er Rabbit has an idea how he might trick the thief. He switches the labels on some of the jars. Br'er Coon exclaims, Yeah, but you was messing up everything. Br'er Rabbit replies, Hey, you just let me do the messing, and I'll fix the mess. A little later, Br'er Bar approaches the store. Br'er Rabbit, who is just finishing setting some jars with the label honey up on the counter, exclaims, Uh-oh, here comes Br'er Bar, quicker than I thunk. Br'er Bar comes into the store. Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Coon are nowhere in sight. So Br'er Bar steals a jar of honey off the counter. 
Then Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Coon walk in. Br'er Bar, holding the jar behind him, says, Duh, Br'er Coon, duh. I was looking for a, a Japanese back scratcher. Is you got one? Br'er Coon says, Just saw the last one, 11 years ago. So Br'er Bar backs out the door, first picture bottom row, saying, Well, guess I'll have to try someplace else. And off he goes. Br'er Coon says to Br'er Rabbit, Did he take one? Br'er Rabbit giggles, Yeah, let's follow. A little later, behind a board fence on the edge of the community, Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Coon see Br'er Bar open the jar of honey, and they hear him say, <laughs> No use looking for a honey tree when Br'er Coon puts it in jars for me. <laughs> and they watch as he drinks from the jar. And then they see him jump up and dash into town. And they hear him saying, <laughs> As he comes into town, Br'er Coon yells, Hey, come quick, Doc Brain. Br'er Bar can't open his mouth. And Br'er Rabbit, standing in front of the store, giggles, <laughs> Looks like he got stuck. And last picture is Doc Crane works on Br'er Bar. Br'er Coon asks, Hey, how'd you do it, Br'er Rabbit? And Br'er Rabbit replies, Oh, I just switched the honey labels to the glue jars. And Br'er Bar says, <laughs> Doc Crane pulls at the glue, saying, Who's still Br'er Bar? And Uncle Remus says, The label don't count if the stuff ain't inside. <laughs> oh, that was a good joke <laughs> on Br'er Rabbit. Because <laughs> yeah. Br'er Rabbit put the honey label on the glue bottles and then he put them on the counter. <laughs> and Br'er Bar snitched what he thought was honey. But when he got it in his mouth, I'll bet he thought it was a strange kind of bee that made that stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, Br'er Rabbit is so cute and so clever. Yes, you bet he is. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right. Connie Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend Miss Honey next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.